Book Three, The Quest of the Mighty Grail. Chapter One. How the Holy Grail Came to Camelot. It was the day before the Feast of Pentecost, and the knights were riding into Camelot from every direction to take their places at the round table on the next day. Nearly all of them had arrived in time for the evening service in the great minster, and thereafter they were gathered together for supper in the hall of the castle. On a sudden there came a fair lady riding fast on a white horse, and she came before the king and did reverence to him, crying, Sire, for God's sake, tell me, where is Sir Lancelot? He is yonder, answered King Arthur. Look, you can see him. Then she went to Sir Lancelot and said, Good night, I require you to come with me into the forest nearby. What will you with me? asked Sir Lancelot. That you will know when you come that you shall know when you come thither. Well, I will gladly go with you. And so saying, Sir Lancelot turned and bid farewell to the king and queen. Wait, cried Guinevere. Will you leave us now, the night before Pentecost? Madam, said the lady, he shall be with you again by dinner time tomorrow, that I promise you. Then they rode away into the forest and came before long to an abbey, and there Lancelot was welcomed by the monks and nuns and led into a fair guest chamber where he was unarmed. There he found his two cousins, Sir Bors and Sir Lionel, who were spending the night there on their way to Camelot, and they rejoiced to be together again. While they were talking, there came in twelve nuns leading Galahad with them, the fairest, finest youth in all the world. Sir, said the lady abbess to Lancelot, this boy is of royal lineage, and him we have tended since he was a child. Nacians, the hermit of Carbonek, has instructed him, and of the use of arms he has learnt also. Now we pray, pray you to make him a knight, for there are no man's hands more worthy than yours, wherefrom he may receive the high order of knighthood. But that I will do, said Sir Lancelot, for he knew now that Galahad was his own son, born in the mysterious castle of Carbonek. All that night Galahad kept his vigil kneeling before the altar in the chapel of the monastery, and in the morning after the early service Lancelot blessed him and made him a knight. God make you a good man, he said, even as there is none more fair to see in this world than you are, and now, fair Sir Galahad, will you come with me to the court of King Arthur? Not yet, he answered, but soon shall you see me there. So Lancelot rode back to Camelot with Bors and Lionel, and found the whole company gathered about the round table in the great hall, and in letters of gold upon each siege was written the name of him who should sit there, and that morning every seat was full except for the siege perilous, wherein none might sit and arise from it living save he for whom it was made. As Lancelot went to take his place at one side of it, and Percival on the other, they saw suddenly a new writing grow in letters of gold upon the siege perilous. Four hundred and fifty and four years after the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, this siege should be filled. It seems to me, said Sir Lancelot, after they had all gazed for a little while in, in silence, that this siege ought to be filled upon this very day, for today is the first Pentecost after the four hundred and fifty-four years. But let us cover the siege perilous with a silken cloth until he comes whose place it is. When this was done, King Arthur bade them all sit down to dinner, but Sir Kay, the steward, um, the steward exclaimed, Sir, if you go now to your meat, you break the old custom of our, your court, for never before on this day have you sat down to dinner until you have seen some strange adventure. You speak truth, said Sir King Arthur, but I marveled so at the words written upon the siege perilous that I did not for the moment think of the old custom. Even while they stood speaking, in came a squire and said to the king, Sir, I bring you news of a wonder. What is it? asked the king. Sir, answered the squire, there is a great square stone floating upon the river, and in it I saw sticking a bright sword with a handle of gold shaped like a cross. Then the king said, I will see this marvel. So all the knights went with him, and they came across the great meadow beside the castle and found the stone floating by the river bank with the sunlight flashing from the jewels in the hilt of the sword until it circled the cross like a halo. And upon the sword were written these words, Never shall man take me hence, but only he by whose side I ought to hang, 
and he shall be the best knight in the world. When the king read these words, he said to Sir Lancelot, Fair sir, this sword ought to be yours, for I am sure that you are the best knight in the world. But Sir Lancelot thought, about, thought upon Queen Guinevere and the shameful love that was between them, and he said quietly, Sir, this is not my sword, nor am I worthy to wear it at my side. Evil shall come to any who seeks to draw it, knowing that he is not worthy. Now, fair nephew, King Arthur said to Sir Gawain, do you try to draw it? Sir, answered Gawain, that have I no wish to do. Try to draw it nevertheless, said King Arthur, I command you. So your command will I obey, said Gawain. So saying, he took the sword by the handle, but he could not stir it. Then Sir Percival tried also at King Arthur's wish, but he might not stir it either, and there was no other knight who dared set his hand to it. Now may we go to our dinner, said Sir Kay, for you have indeed seen a marvelous adventure. So they returned to the hall and sat themselves down, every seat being filled save only the, sa the siege perilous, which was covered with the silken cloth. But they had not put forth their hands to the meal when there came a mighty blast of wind which seemed to shake all the castle, and after it a great stillness. Before God, dear friends, said King Arthur in a hushed voice, this is a day of marvels. What else we shall see before night I wonder greatly. Even as he spoke there appeared in the doorway an ancient man with a long white beard leading by the hand a tall young knight, the fairest that any had seen, who was clad all in dark red armor. He had no sword or shield, but an empty scabbard hung at his side, and Lancelot knew that it was his son Sir Galahad and Nessians, the ancient hermit of Carbonek. Peace be with you all, fair lords, cried Nessians, and then to King Arthur he said, My lord king, I bring you hither a young knight of royal lineage, the descendant of Joseph of Arimathea, and by this knight the marvels of your court and of the strong realm of Logris shall be fully accomplished. Right welcome are you to my court, said King Arthur. Then Nessians, the hermit, led Galahad straight up the hall to the siege perilous, between Sir Lancelot and Sir Percival, and drew away the silk cloth, and now all might see that the letters of the morning were there no longer, but in their stead a new inscription. This is the siege of Sir Galahad, the high prince. Sir, said Nessians, you perceive that this place is yours. Then Galahad sat down in the siege perilous and said, Now, reverend sir, you may go, for your commands have been done but know that I shall come again to Carbonek, and that before long. So Nessians, the hermit, departed from amongst them, and all the knights of the round table wondered greatly that Sir Galahad sat there un unharmed, but Lancelot looked upon his son and smiled proudly. <clears throat> upon pain of my life this young knight shall achieve great things, exclaimed Sir Bors of Deganus. When dinner was ended, Sir King Arthur led Galahad down to the riverside and showed him the sword and the floating stone. Here is a great, as great a marvel as ever I saw, said the king. Two of the best knights in the world have tried in vain to draw it forth. Sir, said Galahad, that is not strange, for this adventure is not theirs but mine. See you, I wear a scabbard but no sword, for I knew that I should find this waiting for me. So saying, he put out his hand, drew the sword easily from the stone, and slid it into the sheath at his side, saying as he did so, Now have I the sword that struck the Dolores stroke. Once it hung in Sir Belin's side, at Sir Belin's side, and with it he slew his brother Balin. But Merlin set it thus in the stone, that it might come to my hand on the day appointed, and shine there to the glory of God. After that, armor, after that armor and horses were brought, and the knights jousted in the meadow by the river. Fair sir, said King Arthur to Galahad, let me now give you a shield. Not so, answered Sir Galahad, for God will send me a shield at the time appointed. Then he took a spear and jousted with all who came, striking such mighty blows, and riding so well and so furiously that none might stand against him, shieldless though he was. No, not even Sir Tristram or Gareth, but with Sir Lancelot, Sir Gawain, Sir Percival, and Sir Bors, he did not joust. In the evening King Arthur and his knights rode back towards the castle, and as they went, a damsel on a white palfrey came riding towards them. 
She greeted King Arthur and asked if Sir Lancelot was there, and he answered himself, I am here, fair lady. Then she said, weeping sorely, Ah, oh, Sir Lancelot, you know now how great a change has come upon you this day. Damsel, why say you so? he asked. Sir, she answered, sobbing bitterly, I speak the truth. In the morning of this day you were the best knight in the world, but now a better than you has come into the realm of Logris and has drawn forth the sword out of the floating stone, as Merlin knew it should be. I knew well that I was never the best, said Sir Lancelot. Of sinful men you of sinful men you are still the best, cried the damsel, but now a better than you is here. Ah, King Arthur, a greater glory shall be yours this day than any kings ever in their land of Britain. But weep, Sir Lancelot, weep for that which you have lost. So crying, she rode away and was lost in the gathering gloom. Silently they went to the great hall and sat down in their places at the round table. Then King Arthur looked about him and saw that all the sieges were full, and he remembered the words of Merlin, the wise enchanter. Lo now, said King Arthur, there sits a... About this board, the fairest company that ever the world shall see. This is the highest hour of our holy realm of Logris, the hour of the glory of Logris. <clears throat> Even as he said these words, there blew a great wind about the castle, and a mighty crash of thunder shook the place. Then, on a sudden, a sunbeam cut through the gloom from end to end of the great hall, seven times more clear than ever man saw on the brightest day of summer. And the glory of God was upon them all. Each knight looked upon one another, and each saw the other fairer than he had ever seemed before. Yet none could speak a word, and they sat there at the round table as if they had been stricken dumb. Then the Holy Grail entered into the hall, covered in a cloth of white samite, so filled with glorious light that none might behold it. Nor could they see who carried the Holy Grail, for it seemed to glide upon the sunbeam, passing through the midst of them and filling them with the joy and peace of the fullness of God. Then on a sudden it departed from among them, and none might see where it went, but the sunbeam faded also, and they sat in silence, filled with a great peace. Only Sir Mordred hid his face in his hands, and the hot tears of shame trickled between his fingers. Presently Sir Arthur said in a hushed voice, Surely we ought to thank our Lord Jesus Christ that he has sent his blessing upon us on this, the high feast of Pentecost. Truly we are blessed above all men, said Sir Gawain, yet surely this day has but shown us that there are greater glories yet to seek after. Even now when the Holy Grail came amongst us, it was so veiled from our sight that we might not see it nor draw near to it, Wherefore I make here a vow that tomorrow morning, without any delay, I shall go forth in quest of the Holy Grail, and never cease until I have achieved that quest, or learnt that I am not worthy to achieve it. When the other knights of the round table heard Sir Gawain say this, nearly all of them rose up also and made the same vow. Alas, cried King Arthur, fair nephew, you have well nigh slain me with that vow, for now you have taken from me the fairest and the truest knighthood that ever was seen together in any realm of the world. For when you all depart from hence, I am sure that never again will this full company be met together here about the table round. For many shall die upon that quest, and thinking that I am sorely grieved, for I have loved you all as well as my life. Moreover, I know that hereafter shall come the passing of the realm of Logris, and that the time draws near of that last battle, whereof Merlin warned me. In the morning all those knights who were sworn to the great adventure met in the minster, and made anew their vows of knighthood. Then in ones and twos they rode away from Camelot, some this way and some that, in quest of the Holy Grail. <laughs>